Yeah, please, you know, any time you have anything to say, don't hesitate. Just email. Very happy with that. Yeah, I forgot the introduction. Becky is from the Institute and has a whole career background studying both capital and children's literacy issues. Sure. Oh, yeah, this is very interesting and fun for me, too. So the first question that Lindsay asked was really uh, how I think about or define academic literacy. And that, that's an interesting question for me because I really don't really use the term academic literacy too much, but I think it's probably a very useful shorthand uh, for a lot of things that I, that I do think about a lot and do work on a lot. So I, I wanted to first kind of break that down, um, you know, unpackage, I guess, a little bit the term academic literacy. As, I, as I've already said here today, I, I think it's important you know, to think about the components. What, what do we really mean by academic literacy? Well, there are at least four different things that are kind of packaged into that term. First one is academic English. So that's the oral language proficiency that you need to succeed in school and in life. That's you know, listening and speaking skills for the most part. The second is reading ability. I could say academic reading, I suppose. So those are the, the literacy skills you need. The third is writing. Um, which is a very important part of literacy as well. So there's an academic writing ability that needs to be developed. And then the fourth is academic content knowledge. In other words, you know, knowing what you need to know in your school subject areas, math, history, social studies, and so on. So those four things are very interdependent, actually. And so it's, it's useful to have a term like academic literacy that kind of encompasses them all. So you can think of them all as you know as, as a goal, but I think when you when you want to understand how you develop academic literacy, it's probably a good idea to go back to this you know four part thinking so that you can really think about effective learning and development in each of these areas and how those four areas of learning and development really do interact at various stages. So the the two the two um, LOIs that, that you're considering address um, phase, somewhat different phases of development. So the first one is uh, kindergarten, or actually extending back to, into pre-kindergarten through third grade. And that's the, the SEAL one. And the um, partners is really a K-5, right, elementary school. And so those really present rather different issues in terms of academic literacy development in each of these four areas. Right? So I, I, first of all, I, I'm, I don't have a lot to say about um, writing uh, development, except to say that don't forget it. It's really, really, really important. And that there's a lot of things we know about what it takes to support um, English language learners and writing development you know, uh, across the course of elementary uh, school. And so that's, that should be a, a part of what, what your, your funders, funded uh, grants do. And I don't have much to say about content knowledge either, except that um, this is where the question of, of um, <coughs> excuse me, bilingual education and dual immersion comes up most often, right? Because the issue is really, you know, how do you make sure that kids um, who are limited in their English abilities are keeping up with their content learning? And, and one of the obvious ways to address that is through uh, instruction in the first language. So that they get in the content and <coughs> they're not falling behind. OK, so let me say something about um, oral language development, about, uh, about academic English development. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a standard distinction that uh, researchers have made between what they call uh, Bix and Kalps. I mean, you, you probably heard these terms thrown <laughs> about. Um, so the, the distinction is really the kind of uh, Bix is your basic interpersonal communication skill. So it's the kind of <clears throat> language proficiency you need in order to kind of deal with uh, social interaction on a daily basis. And uh, Kalps is the cognitive academic language proficiency. It's the kind of oral language you need to be successful in a school setting, in an academic setting, and then later on in, in a work setting as well. So that these two you know, kinds of language, oral language skills are rather different. Um, and as it turns out, a lot of kids you know, come into school 
with pretty good interpersonal language skills. So they're sort of everyday English, maybe not so bad, at least it's functional, but have really low levels of academic language development. So, so that's something to be, to be concerned of. It's something that's often missed. Um, I mean, one of the keys to um, really making sure that kids are going to be ready to succeed in school is vocabulary development. And there's been a lot of uh, interest, research, emphasis lately on vocabulary development from birth up through school. And so I think that, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, we, what you're considering here would really address directly the issue of how you increase vocabulary development in the preschool years, but that is a, a critical issue. Um, it's one that can have tremendous effects on success and readiness for school. And there has been some really interesting research on differences in vocabulary development uh, from, you know, low income, the middle class, you know, sort of environments and for different, you know, cultural backgrounds. There are big differences in the kinds of uh, vocabulary in the first language and in English. <laughs> very big differences. So that typically a lot of kids come to school with very limited vocabulary. And that that's, that's a, a, can really be an issue that holds them back. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an important piece. Um, but in general, I guess the thing I wanted to stress about oral language development is that it really does support and is it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient for, uh, for academic literacy. You really have to have good language skills. And if you have good language skills in the first language, those language skills can translate to both uh, language proficiency and literacy proficiency in the second language. That's something the research is very strong on. We know that. There is transfer. So, you know, it does pay off to really focus on language, oral language development in the first language. And so I think that's one of the strengths of the SEAL proposal. They recognize that clearly that, you know, having um, support for Spanish uh, language development can really help with English literacy development. And also, I think the other thing they recognize in terms of oral language is that having good models of English uh, language is really critical and often missing. So they, they propose, for example, to bring in, I guess, tutors uh, or others who can be, you know, sort of good English language models for kids in, in uh, K-3 school, which I think is a, is a very good thing. Okay. So in terms of, um, uh, just to talk now a little bit more about um, literacy development, um, one of the things I, I had a chance to look at, uh, Lindsay sent me, was this uh, Grant Makers for Education uh, piece that uh, is on investing in, um, in uh, educational opportunities for English language learners. And it's, I think it's, it's generally really good. I really liked almost everything I saw in there. Uh, so I think this is, is very useful as a kind of the big picture of uh, what the issues are. I mean, one of the things I think that's really very important to point out, that's pointed out here, is that English language learners are incredibly diverse. You know, and that, that diversity is one of the biggest challenges for education right now because they all have different needs. They come with different backgrounds, different levels of, you know, of proficiency in their first language and so on. There's so much diversity there. That's something that you have to always keep in mind. The one thing I, I found was a little bit, mm, I'm going to get nitpicky here, was not quite what I would like the message to be here. Uh, was in, uh, there was a section here about developing early literacy. And, um, it did, I mean, the, the general point is, is well taken, that developing early literacy is important, but it's not sufficient. But I think um, I, I'd like to clarify this point just a little bit. Um, one of the things we've learned about early literacy, and we, we, as I say, we know a lot about, you know, sort of the foundation skills that lead to early literacy development, uh, including, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, vocabulary and phonemic awareness and being able to manipulate the alphabets and understanding the relationship of sounds and symbols. All these really foundation skills that you have to build in, you know, preschool through third grade. We, we understand that pretty well. Um, what often happens, though, is that, you know, English language learners are able to master those kind of word learning skills and word reading skills 
So, for example, they, you know, they, they can sound out a word. They can, you know, kind of follow along in a text and, and read aloud. But, you know, they, even though they may have developed those kinds of, um, you know, word-level reading skills, they're still lacking comprehension. And so there's a critical transition, and, and for a lot of reasons, partly because their oral English is not that good, so they can be actually saying the words but not really understanding them because they don't know all the words. And also that it, they have don't understand, perhaps, uh, or not familiar enough with uh, English syntax and structure, and so they may have trouble with, with that aspect of, the, of English as well. But so, so that's, that, there is a critical transition point that we often talk about this, this transition from learning to read, which is the process of sort of based, mastering those foundation skills up to around third grade, and then reading to learn, which is where you really transitioning from learning, you know, the foundation skills to using your reading ability to gain knowledge. And what, what's really critical about that transition is that students, the children, achieve a level of reading fluency or, or, or sort of, well actually, it's sort of speed in reading. So that when they, it's, think of it this way, when you, you start a sentence, by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you, it, it should be a short enough time that you can remember what was happening at the beginning of that sentence. Because, you know, as you're a young, you know, young kids, as they struggle to sound out words and they, they read word by word, you know, they often miss the point of the sentence. They, they miss that because it takes a long time to get from the start to the end. So there's a level of fluency, a level of, you know, reading accuracy and speed that you need to achieve in order to really get good comprehension. And again, this is, this is, this is the puzzling part. Uh, this is true for all, all kids, right? You have to achieve that fluency in order to be a good reader. And if you don't get to it um, by the end of third grade, the texts become much more content heavy from fourth grade on. There's a lot more knowledge to be gained. You have to read a lot, and you fall farther and farther behind if you don't have that fluency. Right? Um, but for the English language learners, they often appear to have that fluency, and yet they're not comprehending. Right? So this is where teachers sometimes are fooled, um, because the kids are reading. They're reading at a pace that seems to be adequate for grade level, and yet their comprehension is not, not there. And it's because of their you know, lack of vocabulary knowledge, uh, limited vocabulary, and all other you know, sort of lack of background content knowledge. They just have a hard time uh, really making sense of the text, and, and so they fall behind. So this is where I think, I think it's really good that um, for the partners as I uh, uh, project that they're really focusing on this, you know, across this transition. That it's not just up to third grade, but beyond third grade, because there really are. I think there's a level of awareness that teachers need to have, and that they often don't have, of how they should recognize when English learners are having these sorts of uh, comprehension problems that, that often come up, and yet you know they still have they have may have the fluency, um, and still still have, have miss, and be missing that comprehension, and and, and teachers don't often are often aware of that are not fully able to you know, sort of adjust their instruction to, to deal with that. So, I, so it, the second question that, that Lizzie asked me, sorry, I'm getting into the weeds, I know, <laughs> was really about what, um, um, what elements make for successful teacher training and around academic language and literacy. And I, I think that, um, you know, I, I can't really get too far into the, you know, the, the details of that here, but I, I would say that um, you know, there, there are a few points that I, I can make based on what we sort of know uh, from the research is effective instruction and, and uh, what we don't know. And I, I already mentioned the, some of the uh, points about what we don't know, but I'm going to start with those. Uh, what we don't know is mostly in the area of English language development, oral language development. Um, it's really, the research doesn't give us that you know, kind of very clear through the guidance about the structure for English oral language ins instruction that is most effective. And it's partly because there's such that great diversity of English language learners out there. And so what works for one type of English learner may not work for others. And we just haven't really sorted it all out in terms of, you know, what's the most effective 
method overall. Um, we do know that oral English language development can be uh, taught effectively in the areas of vocabulary. That's something that you know kids do, you know, attend if they're explicitly taught vocabulary that works. They gain vocabulary, and in listening comprehension, those two things can be taught. Um, but as far as uh, whether immersion or is the best way, or how long immersion should should be in the in the second language, or when you should, how you should transition from the first language to the second language, we don't know. We do know that primary language support is effective. So that means that teachers should, in, in teaching, whenever possible, be able to use a student's first language to offer an explanation, you know, to, uh, to give a definition, to just, you know, uh, to answer a question. If, you know, it can, it can be very simple. And there are ways, I think, that you can structure um, primary language support materials. I, I've seen this done, actually, in Helm Rock. For teachers, for example, who are not Spanish speakers, but are given you know, a pronunciation guide with simple definitions for vocabulary development, can actually point out cognates. This is for older students, not, not for, for upper elementary. Not for older. But there are ways you can do that. So I think that's an important piece that should be you know, looked for if there should be primary language. And we do know, too, in terms of oral language development, that explicit direct instruction is effective. So in other words, um, I mean, I, I think there's a, I, I'm not sure I see this in either of the two proposals. And, and particularly in the SEALS proposal, it seemed that they, they talk about sort of uh, enriched, enriched curriculum and exposure, but not really so much about explicit instruction in oral English, in other words, really, you know, focusing on, you know, learning vocabulary and learning syntax in a very direct and explicit way. I think that's something that, it, I, I think the research is pretty clear that, that the direct, explicit method is effective and should, should be incorporated. It's not just exposure, it needs to be direct instruction. Okay, so what about in terms of, um, Yeah, what we know about uh, what works in literacy instruction. Um, well, this is here's the good news. <laughs> uh, what the research is pretty good on this. Uh, what works for uh, for non English learners in terms of reading instruction also works for English learners. So all that research that we've done on uh, building phonemic awareness, all that research on you know building um, vocabulary all these teaching reading strategies, all that applies. All those effective methods for organizing instruction and collaborative group process, all that works with English learners. So that's, that's the good news. Um, you don't have to do it differently, but you do often have to modify and enrich that instruction to make it work for English learners. So that's the kind of thing. Actually, again, I, I think the partner's uh, proposal is very powerful in that respect, in that they do seem to really recognize that you can have good teaching happening, but there's maybe just the one missing piece, which is the teachers aren't really aware of how to just adapt and enrich that instruction to make it work for the English learners in the class. And I think that, you know, with training and coaching, as in the partner's model, those strategies for teachers can be taught and they can have lasting effects. So there are things like using the primary language, you know, occasionally. Uh, things like, you know, using you know, graphics whenever possible. Uh, simple things, you know, that most, a lot of good teachers would already be doing, but need to be sort of emphasized as supports, slowing things down, supports that English language learners particularly can benefit from. Uh, and there's a whole, you know, there's a very long list of those uh, good teaching practices. So that's, um, yeah, that's about it for what I have to Say I have. <laughs> um, I, 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 I have uh, actually another recommendation, which is a short article that um, my, my, one of the people I work with a lot, Claude Goldenberg, who's a professor here at Stanford. He wrote a, a piece not long ago called "Teaching English Language Learners," which summarizes a lot of uh, just the points that I've been saying, and of course, in a, in a more um, 
coherent way <laughs> and more in more detail with references. So if you wanted to follow up, but this is it. I, I can give the PDF to uh, to Lindsay so you can have these. It's yeah, it's it's a useful piece. Too. Yeah. Oh. The That's a good question. Kind of get to the top and are therefore able to like, go to Stanford and MIT and well, language. You know, it, it's. It, I think there are a couple of things going on there. I, I've taught English overseas, so I, I know you're you're right. <laughs> People learn English, and they learn English in environments where they're they're not really English rich environments. They're environments where they have very few opportunities to encounter good English. And yet they learn, and I think that you know part of it is um, that they're really motivated to learn English, and that motivation makes a big difference. And and part of it is that um, they really have a strong foundation in their first language, and that and, uh, and that's all the research is saying that that strong foundation in in any in, in a language uh, and in literacy in another language makes a big difference. It transfers. Uh, to your second language, or third language, or whatever you know you're studying. So that's a really strong argument for Spanish language and literacy developments being a focus. I mean, I think that's one of the tragedies of California's um, policy. Used we used to do it that way. Now we have you know kind of quick you know immersion, a quick you know study, and then you're mainstream. And uh, there's also another big issue uh, in the side. It's a little off topic from the question, but I think it's important to note. Um, right now, the way that we classify English language learners in the school system is really very inconsistent. It varies from school district to school district. Nobody really knows if that system is working well or even what effect it's having on the kids who are you know, classified as English learners or classified as fluent English proficient and what it takes you know, to change classification. We don't, we don't really know. We were not allowed to use cognates. We were uh -huh. not allowed to explain anything explicitly. I was told explicitly, do not let them see you conjugating verbs in the classroom. You are not allowed to speak in the first language at all to the students. I it's, got the very, the, we're the most inexperienced teacher. We got the very earliest English language learners. Uh, thrown in the classroom, could not speak to them in their own language, and could not explain to them. The middle school age kids who spoke Spanish, by and large, were not allowed to explain to them, here's how we do it in Spanish. So we do the same thing in English, only it's slightly different because it's both based on Latin. We couldn't yeah. do that. Yeah. Why not? We weren't allowed to. I can only tell you. We had no curriculum. I had to find my own curriculum for everything. It is a mess. How long ago was that? 2003, 2004. Yeah, could have been changed so dramatically, but I doubt it. There, it was all built on the um, theories of first language acquisition, uh -huh. which is mommy yes. babbles at babies yes. until baby yes. catches on. Yeah. Yes. So that's yes. what we were supposed to do: is explain yeah, everything that in English, sort of and maybe so the, and maybe the kids would catch on eventually. Well, we know we, we should we should know better. Now we do know better now. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, just at the end of your your presentation, you were mentioning about how important actual, like sort of academic instruction is. Yes. And you mentioned a whole, um, you know, like using graphics. And yes, like that. right. And then you said there's a lot of great um, methods. Yes. So I'm wondering, just back to our conversation here, uh -huh. if, if SRI has these, a list of great methods, are nonprofits using them? Um, is SEAL using them? Sort of how, uh -huh. does, how does your work yeah. relate to what people are actually doing? Right. We, we don't do a lot of... Uh, professional development and our technical systems, that sort of thing, we evaluate programs. So uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we know w whether there's evidence of something working or not. We don't really make a list, that sort of list, but uh, Claude does in his article. And um, I mean, I could definitely give you references for places to go there. Like, um, for example, like West Ed you know, provides a lot of 
professional development. They have a program in professional development for English uh, language and development and literacy. And they've got materials of uh, all kinds of you know teaching strategies and methods that, that would be useful. So it's possible that those could be resources for whoever we. Oh yeah, funded. yeah, definitely. And actually, there there was a, a part of this uh, review of the research literature on uh, on uh, li literacy for second language learners was a review of instructional methods and approaches. So there's a chapter in this um, review that covers you know what we know about what's effective in terms of instructional in terms of curriculum instruction um, for, for language. Um, on that subject, though, do you think that I would put in a plug here as kind of a personal interest and in something I've been working on recently. There's a lot of talk um, now about cradle to career uh, trajectories and you really kind of make the connections, you know, between, you know, learning, you know, from birth, you know, through college and in, into, into later life. And the good thing about that is to really, it really kind of highlights how, um, you know, having that kind of focus on the future. Uh, can really make a big difference for families, uh, you know, in terms of how they think about their kids' education and the kind of possibilities there are for that. And that kind of awareness, you know, even starting from preschool uh, of, you know, sort of what, 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 is it, what does it take for my kid to be ready for kindergarten? <laughs> what does it take for them, you know, and, and where is that going to lead them in life? You know, that sort of thinking, as, as you were describing, you know, it really turns out can have a very, you know, positive influence on kids development and so I think just kind of adding that to just maybe it maybe a seal program would be like having that family component where you talk to you know parents about well you know your kids have you know the opportunity to you know do well in school and from there to go on to a life that is actually going to be you know really productive and, and useful and here here are the paths you know that they they could follow and it starts right here you know, starts right here with their, you know, learning English and learning vocabulary that's going to help them and so on, you know. So that's what that's nice. Sensitive to everybody's time. Oh, I'm sorry. We have probably <laughs> maybe time for one more question, and then yeah. it's mm -hmm. 1.30, if you want to get in and ask questions, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask about Reggie questions. You can, but you want to be sensitive to the time that the meeting adjourns at 1.30. I don't really have a question, but I just, one other thing that I found out when I was teaching was, I know there's kind of a stupid old saying that says that, uh, Breakfast with ham and eggs, the chicken is involved, and the pig is committed. Um, when I talked to the kids there, um, these are the middle school age kids, but a lot of them that were Spanish speakers did not particularly feel like having to learn a second language, and they were right because a lot of their parents had told the kids, We are here long enough to make enough money to buy a house back in Mexico, and then we're leaving. That doesn't give a kid a lot of incentive to redo everything he's already done in Spanish in a second language if he's only going to be here for a year. And that was true for a lot of the population. So if, if kids are going to stay here... No. Yeah, but even they still need... I, mean, I would no, say, I'm not arguing yeah, whether it's right yeah. or not. I mean, that, from the kids' perspective... No. But it, it even, even, even having the opportunity to really acquire good proficiency in Spanish would be nice. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, right. 